you and I see the massive wave of extra credit I'm bestowing <laughs> on this crowd. And I think this is going to be a good evening. Yes. This is a good way to start the semester. So uh, let's get started. Let's talk about this. Is science sick? Uh, science is almost always in the news, right? It's always wedged in there somewhere between sports and weather. Some new breakthrough, some new technology, an iPhone 17, Siri, self-driving cars. Uh, so it's usually in the news in good ways, right? Exciting things. Uh, but this past year has not been a great year news-wise for science. There has been a lot of media scrutiny about whether or not science is working as well as it should. Uh, I know many of our students are passionate about reading The Economist, uh, so you probably all saw this article, uh, or The New York Times, or NPR, or Slate, or any of the other sanctioned Oak Park news outlets that we all read and love. Uh, there's been a lot out there about this question, this idea, what if science, which is supposed to be our best way of learning about the world, isn't working so well anymore? What if it's broken? What if it's sick? Um, people have called it a replication crisis or a crisis of confidence. And this is at least somewhat unique because these criticisms aren't coming from the outside in. This is not uh, Congress people worrying about scientific waste and spending. Uh, this is not anti-vaxxers decrying the state of the pharmaceutical industry. This is scientists actually saying to each other, we might not be doing this right. There might be a problem here. So let me give you a flavor of that to start, and it's shocking. Um, I'm going to give you some discourse from scientists about their science. Here are two articles uh, from one of the luminaries in this science crisis, John Ioannidis, a Greek physician who's now at Stanford University. These are titles of articles he's published. Most published research findings are false. Just there's it in the title. Most of what you can read in the research world is just false. Uh, Evidence-based medicine has been hijacked. Strong words, right? Now, based on the first one, that most things you read in journals are false, then I guess at least one of those two's got to be wrong, and then there, there's a whole paradox there, but we're going to, we'll move on. Uh, ben Goldacre, who's been really prominent in helping push forward evidence-based medicine, just says simply in his book, Bad Pharma, medicine is broken. We're not doing this right. We're no longer getting the evidence we need to make good decisions with physicians and in healthcare. Uh, Andrew Gelman, this is such a weird thing to say, a famous statistician? What a weird thing to say. Uh, among statisticians, not obviously amongst the rest of you who've never heard of him. Uh, but he says, uh, anything published in 2015 or earlier is part of the too big to fail era of science. It's potentially a junk bond supported by toxic loans and you shouldn't rely on it. Wow. These are very, very strong words. And for that kind of extraordinary claim, that science has gone wrong, you really need extraordinary evidence before we would doubt something that has such an established track record, right? So that's what we're going to do uh, tonight, is hopefully have a conversation. I want to talk with you and present to you the evidence that has these scientists so worked up, that has them so worried about what I believe is the best of what we are as humans. Uh, we'll talk about what might have gone wrong. We'll try to analyze, if it is broken, what, has, what needs fixed. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what you could do personally uh, to try to help and in your own life. Um, but before we start that, we should probably at least mention why you might want to care, right? Is this just a personal dispute among some scientists or is this something that we should all be really agitated and concerned about? Um, so let's just briefly, why do we care? I, th I hope we already do, but just, just in case there's those few people who are just here for the extra credit. Uh, We'll say one good reason is because it's your tax dollars at work. Our country uh, devotes more of its budget to research and development than any other country in the world, and it's substantial. It's around $140 billion every year that's uh, used by the government to support research. Uh, and as you can see, that number has grown and grown and grown. It goes through some cycles, but it's a lot of money, and we'd like to know that we're getting good value for that money, right? We'd like to know that we're not just flushing it down the toilet doing science that doesn't make sense or that gives us false conclusions. Uh, we might be upset or we might care about this situation because uh, we might hope to gain the benefits of science, right? Uh, I believe in science. I believe it works well. And when it works well, we can often use what we learn to do good in society, that there have been many fruits of society. That's sometimes a controversial thing to say, especially on an academic campus, but I think science has been a positive force in our civilization. And you can see it in our rising 
uh, life expectancy and standards of care uh, and the fact that we reap benefits. And I'd like to keep reaping those benefits. I'd like more medicines, right, and more breakthroughs and more technologies to do better and better, wouldn't you? I don't want medicine that doesn't actually work or false hope. Uh, if you're an ethicist, you might think about the ethical uh, dimensions of this. Uh, science is done at a cost, not just in terms of money, but in terms of risk and animal lives and pain and suffering. People sign up for trials and they put themselves at risk trying out placebos or real experimental drugs, uh, trying to treat diseases that may, they may have had other options to try to treat. Uh, and if we're not doing good with that data or if that data doesn't really help us, there's not a good ethical case for putting people or animals through that. But the last one, and the one maybe, uh, maybe I can help you appreciate this, I, I find this just fascinating. Uh, this science is what the best of us do. It's, it's the best way we have of knowing, and it's the smart people that get together and try to figure this all out. And if they're doing it wrong, like what? That's crazy, right? And how would you even know that other people don't know what they're supposed to know? And there's this whole kind of epistemological ice cream sundae to dig into here. Uh, and I'm geeky enough to think that that's awesome uh, and to want to think about that, right? And I, and I want to think about that because we're all in the business of trying to figure out how the world works. We're all in the business of trying to make sense of the universe and our place in it. You don't have to be a scientist or a PhD to want to do that. And so if we can learn some lessons about how scientists got it wrong, it can have some real application in our own lives to try to help us avoid the same mistakes. So that's my pitch. This is why we might want to care. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's the evidence? What's everybody so worked up about? Um, well, I'm going to start by telling you a bit about some what's called replication research or replication studies. This is where a scientist tries to repeat what another scientist has done. She gathers the same protocol, the same materials, talks to similar types of participants, and gathers the same types of data in the hopes that the similar patterns would appear, that she would get the same results. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of that during this replication crisis, trying to figure out just how reliable is the, are the things that we think we know. And I'm going to show you the evidence in a second, but let's see what you guys thought in the survey we had out in the atrium. Let's see uh, what people had to say in terms of how well they thought this might work. So I've got to bring this up in my Gmail, and I hope you can see this right here. We just did a survey, but I didn't get IRB approval, so hopefully they're not going to come <coughs> tear that down. Let's see if this works or not. <coughs> oh, it did work, kind of. There we go. Uh, here's the question about how repeatable do we think science ought to be, right? Uh, so it's a bit blurry here for my phone, but down there is 0%, and nobody thinks it should be 0% reliable. That makes sense, right? If science, if nothing repeated, there'd be no point in doing it. And in fact, it seems like the majority of us think it should be very, very reliable, right? If it got published, we should be able to bank on it. All right, so keep that in mind, and let me begin to depress the shit out of you. <laughs> Excuse me. I mean the... Okay, let's start with industry. Uh, as our government and other governments started pouring more and more money into research, industry noticed. And they said, hey, you know what? These academic researchers, these crazy flower children high on their government grants, they do this research and then they just publish it for like everyone to know about. They don't even monetize it or turn it into a patented drug or jack up the prices on EpiPens. That's so weird, <laughs> right? And they said, maybe we could like drink from that fountain, right? Maybe we, the, the corporations, could swoop in, find out what those research scientists are doing, and then turn it into a product right away. It's a smart idea. Amgen is a large pharmaceutical company that had this idea, one of several. So they set up a lab, and they put top researchers into it. I love that phrase, top researchers. They're not at the bottom, they're at the top. And uh, they scoured the journals, and any time a big journal like Science or Cell published a breakthrough about cancer biology that was done in animals, they immediately got the paper, contacted the labs, tried to repeat it in the Amgen labs so that then they could hurry up and turn it into a product. Um, in 2013, they reported in the journal Nature, two of the researchers who led this effort to try to make money off of what we think we know, that they had tried 53 different hot things that they were going to turn into product, products. Six of them were able to be reproduced. Just six. That's it. 
And let's, let's not under, misunderstand this. This doesn't mean only six of them generalize from animals up to humans. Of course, there's going to be some mistakes there. No, they couldn't even repeat what those top journals had just said was doable in their own labs with the best researchers. Only six out of 53, only 11% could happen again. And they shut it down. And that says something. They said that as, as capitalists, they didn't see value in investing in what science was publishing. And that's scary. And they weren't alone. Bayer had the almost the exact same program. They replicated 67 different preclinical studies, all animal studies. Most of them focus on cancer, and there's some overlap between these two. They had a little bit better success. 25% of them they were able to repeat, and the other 75%, they didn't get the same results. There was no breakthrough. The drug didn't work, or the animal still died, or just didn't work like it was supposed to work. And they also closed the program. Now you might think, okay, that's, maybe that's like cancer. Cancer's hard, or maybe it's the animal work or something like that, but it gets worse. Uh, let's move to psychology. Uh, just recently was published a big effort called the Reproducibility Project. Instead of going after what's hot and new, researchers picked up a stack of psychology journals and they randomly picked 100 articles out of it. And then they split up into teams and they repeated each and every one of them, 100 different studies. And they repeated them, trying very hard, working with the original authors to do them exactly as they had been specified. And 40 of these, 40%, spot on, just like they thought. 30 of them were kind of iffy, and the other 30 were clear failures. So somewhere between a 40 to 70% success rate. Well below that big 90 to 100% that we were all hoping to see, right? When we did our survey. Um, one problem with this is that they had so many studies to do, they could only get, collect a decent chunk of people for each one. So they didn't have a huge sample size. But I'll tell you about some additional projects where people have collaborated across the world to be able to get enormous sample sizes that would be really definitive. So if something's real, we would know it. One type of these is called the Many Labs projects. What they did is uh, uh, got labs from all over the world, six, uh, 36 different labs, got together, and they all tested 13 classic studies from psychology, 13 chestnuts that you probably heard about in Psych 101, like the Stroop effect. Remember the Stroop effect, right? Like where if you see the word red, but it's printed in blue dye, it's like all messes with your mind because it's printed in a different color than it's, the word says. Uh, so they repeated these. And because they had 36 different labs from all over the world, they had thousands of participants, and they could check to make sure that it would repeat across cultures and across age groups and all kinds of other things. And this one, it was awesome. 77% of them were exactly like it said in your textbook, which is awesome. So you don't sell it back. Apparently there's, <laughs> there's some decent information in there somewhere. That's good. Uh, so many labs got a little more ambitious. They uh, had 20 labs that signed up to do this again. And what's, I've skipped over many labs two because it's not published yet. It's called many labs three. And they picked 10 studies that are a little more recent, a little more hot, a little more now. All highly cited published in top journals. Uh, and they were really excited about this one because they thought now we're moving forward to the really cool stuff. And then they got really depressed because only 30% of them actually worked like they were supposed to. And that's not good, right? And their experience is uh, mirrored in other collaborative projects. Uh, the Association for Psychological Science organizes these big crowdsourced replications as well. They get people from all over the world. They get a standardized protocol so everybody's doing the same thing. They translate it into different languages. They can collect thousands of participants. They have so far tried five different classic textbook things that are in psychology textbooks everywhere. I'm not going to go through what all of them are, but you might recognize some of them. 20% of them, just one out of those five, replicated. Those are four other pages you do actually need to tear out of your textbook. The other four, they're out. So this is really depressing. Um, I can, one bright note, uh, Dominican helped contribute to this amazing stuff, which got covered in the news and everything. That's uh, a tiny little picture of Kelsey Chaston, who just graduated last year with a degree in psychology. And her honors project was being one of those sites that collected all the data and sent it in. And she's now a published author on this paper, totally destroying your textbook. What a cool thing. <laughs> to do, right? And uh, Kelsey's contribution is part of something that uh, Tracy and I got started in the department and that we started working on. And, and it really came from I could look at this data and I could see it, but I personally have just become uh, more than a little bit obsessed with it, right? I've become obsessed with it because it matters to me. Um, 
you know when you go to a party and somebody says something random about some fact, like I heard China's like this or something, and there's that person that steps up and is like, well, actually, there's a study. <laughs> That's me, right? That's, I'm that guy. I am that, that corrector. I am the person with that study. I have read all of that studies. Uh, I will tell you about all of that studies and how that study shows that you're wrong about any other opinion you might have, <laughs> right? I put a lot of time and effort into being that guy, and now I'm seeing this data that says that I'm totally full of horse shit, and that is not cool. I worked, I actually read the papers. I could have been outside doing something, like meeting girls or something better. I mean, there's, there's a lot more to life than being that guy, and I've been that guy my whole life, right? I, I'm not joking when I say that these, this data crushes me. It crushes me. It keeps me up at night. I do not enjoy giving this talk. I want to give a talk about the cool research stuff that we found, not, holy shit, we're wrong about everything. That is not a fun talk to give. And it, it does crush me. And I had to know. I just, I couldn't let it go seeing these results come in and seeing people say, oh, this is wrong. Oh, this is wrong. We've made a mistake. I needed to know for myself. You know who this is, right? World's greatest medical examiner. Uh, it's Doubting Thomas. I wanted to put his finger in the wounds to know, are they really real? And I think Doubting Thomas gets a bad rap. He is an awesome, like, yeah, I do want to check. Show me. I mean, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I do. I, I just can't help it. I like Doubting Thomas. So I wanted to know, and I've been fortunate to have amazing colleagues like Tracy, who was audacious enough to say, yeah, you don't know anything about social psychology, but I'll help you out. We'll do this together. And really great students. And we have together, across students and Tracy and across the department, we have replicated 11 different high-profile studies in psychology. And let me dive deep into that for a second. Let's, let me show you what that's like uh, and what it looks like to try to replicate something and what the results look like. So I'll talk about the one that Trace and I did together. We saw a paper that was all over the news that said that if you're superstitious, it could make you better at things, which seemed really cool, right? It seemed really cool. Um, for example, they did a couple different types of studies, but I'll give you one. They had people play mini putt-putt golf give them a golf ball and a little target, and they said, go ahead and shoot the ball, see if you can get a hole in one. But some of the people, before they played the game, when they hit them to the golf ball, they said, hey, you got the lucky golf ball. Isn't that cool? And the other people, they said, here's your golf ball. Right? And what they found was that the people who thought they had a lucky golf ball went Tiger Woods on that stuff. <laughs> they, just, they just golfed the crap out of that. They went 20 to 30% better which is a big amount. That's like three letter grades, right? It's like you're a C golfer and now you're an A golfer. That's a, good, that's a lucky golf ball right there, right? And that sounds really intriguing. It sounds exciting. And we got excited about it. We wanted to do it. And when we looked at the paper and there's a dissertation, they had many experiments like this and they all worked. Let me show you. This is a really cool type of graph. It's called a funnel plot. I'm sorry. It's called a forest plot. And it helps... Uh, put years and years of some scientist's research into like something you can look at like that, which is a little depressing, but it's cool. So this line at zero is a tie line. That's when the two groups that you study are exactly tied. And every dot here, every square, is an experiment where they ran. And you can see that this experiment is way up here, and this farther from the tie means that the group that had the lucky ball did much better than the group that didn't have the lucky ball. And the wings on it are the margin of error. Right, because any time you do a sample, you could be wrong a little bit. And so you can see that even though there's a big margin of error, we can see clearly that this group did better than the control group. And when they had another superstitious group, they did better again. And another superstitious group, they did better again. Over and over again, this group kept finding that the superstitious group does better at things. And we thought that was really cool. So we wanted to replicate it. And so we set out to do it. And it took a ton of work. Um, we contacted the original authors. We had to get all the information from them, even beyond the paper. What brand of putter did you use? What was the room like where you had it? How far away was it from the wall? We started working things out. We trained students to do this. We made videos of how we talked to the participants and sent them to the researchers so they could make sure that we were talking to them the same exact way. Um, we tried everything we could to make it exactly the same. And we ran much, much bigger sample sizes so we'd have much smaller margins of error. So we'd be able to really clearly be sure if superstition works. 
And we didn't just do this once, but we kept doing it over and over again, and every time really thinking hard, okay, if it didn't work this way, what if we did it this way? What if we did it this way? And these are the results we got. Ours are the black dots. And remember that tie line, which means the two groups are the same? You can see that each of our studies, we ended up with a tie. The group that had the lucky ball and the group that didn't have a lucky ball, they ended up golfing about the same. No Tiger Woods effects. They were all just regular old hurt tiger? I don't know what they were. <laughs> Something else. Didn't make them amazing at this. And it happened over and over again very consistently. Uh, and we got just extremely different results. And we even, just to make sure that we weren't like idiots or bad at this, uh, for one of the experiments, we added what we call a positive control in science. That's where you run another study with the same people that you know should work, a classic. And it did. So our participants weren't brain dead and we weren't idiots. We could get things to work. We just couldn't get this to work. It just didn't happen. So this is one of 11 painstaking long-term replication projects I've now helped students complete. And they take, they are a pain. Like you've really got to go to the mat. You've got to give it your best effort to try to, your best to make it work. Out of those 11, one of them, one of them has worked as it should. And the other 99, 91%, it's not even close. It's just like what I showed you. There's just nothing like what the original researcher said was happening, not even a glimmer. And that has definitely changed my perspective. It's not just data on the wall for me. It's a tremendous amount of my time and effort, and I am converted. There is a replication problem. Like, this is not working as well as it should. Um, I like this. This is from a, a blog of a researcher uh, in social psych who was not replicated, who had spent his life studying a phenomenon that now has been definitively shown to be not real. And this is what he had to say. I've been doing this for 20 years, but I can't help but wonder if the topics I chose to study are in fact real and robust. Have I been chasing puffs of smoke for all these years? I'm in a dark place. I feel like the ground is moving underneath me, and I no longer know what is real and what is not. And that's, that's right? It's like the best of Strindberg. This is, this is dark, dark, depressing stuff. And that is, as I said, that's me too. I mean, I'm, I have no joy in saying, we tried all this really important stuff and it's not real. That it just, it kills me. And, and it also fascinates me, right? Because what are we doing wrong? How are we supposed to better learn about the world? What has changed or what's different or what's happening? What a puzzle. Right? So as much as I'm depressed by it, I'm also just, I think about it constantly. These are the brightest people. Most of them much brighter than me that went to better schools and published in better journals. And if they're getting it wrong, what hope do we have and what lessons can we learn? Right? So let's talk about that. What has gone wrong? Why do we have this problem? And let me start with a reality check. Maybe not a whole lot. Maybe not a whole lot, actually. What we see is that the recent and hot research is not replicating well. And that's not good, that's depressing, but it may be the price of doing cutting edge science, right? We want scientists out there pushing the envelope, putting forward new theories that bring together the world. Most of those theories are gonna be wrong. That's the nature of trying to figure out how the world works. Most of the time you think you know something, you don't. And sure it got published, but that happens. The, the history of science is littered with false uh, promises and dead alleys and, and things that we used to believe that we don't believe anymore. Tons and tons and tons. So this may be much more normal than we think. It feels raw to us because we're going through it, but every generation has gone through it. And in fact, if you look back in the history of science, there has always been a reform movement in science. Always. There have always been at least some group of scientists yelling at the other group saying, you're doing it wrong. We got to do better. Right? which is how we went from not having placebos in our randomized controlled trials to having them, which is how we got to using statistics rather than using impressions. We've made all these leaps and changes over the years because there's science by nature is self-critical and is always seeking to improve. So I'm in a weird position here because is there a problem? Absolutely, science is kind of sick. But that almost is normal. That's kind of the normal way of science, is that we're always getting some things wrong and we're always trying to do less of it. So we're, we shouldn't be complacent and say, oh yeah, it's normal. It's also normal to not want to say in this situation to try to do better. So we can do better, I think. And there's a whole list of things that we could do better. So maybe it's normal, but we do have some serious problems. Uh, 
there are not many incentives for people to go out and do this type of replication work. There's no funding to go out and try what people have already tried. And when you try to publish it, oh boy, could I feel, I could make your blood pressure go up by sending you back comments you get about how you must be wrong and it's not possible that you didn't get this effect and it's, it's, not, it's thankless work. Uh, there's a huge publisher parish culture uh, where people have to really publish to keep their careers going and we don't want those kinds of incentives. Science started, to be honest, maybe not, science started with the aristocrats, right? Like Lavoisier who just discovered oxygen because he was hanging out with the people in France. They had no incentive, they didn't really care about their publications. And that's a kind of a good thing, right? When they have to be so high stakes, there's a lot more pressure to coax your data or fudge your data or push your data in a way. The decline of tenure has been a big deal, right? Most, it's not just at small schools that rely on adjuncts, it's at big research universities that rely on what they call soft money positions. People are at the university and could apply for grants, but they have to pay their whole salary out of their grant. The university gives them nothing. And that means that if they don't get the next grant, they lose everything. And that means that the incentives for them to have an amazing paper become much more than we would like for objective work, right? There's a lot we could talk about and hopefully we'll have a good discussion. But I wanted to focus in on two things that are prominent uh, that I think have some lessons for our own lives. So I thought we'd do this because I don't know if any of you have big lessons about tenure right now. But, <laughs> but what we can talk about is problems with sample size and problems with getting the whole story. And let's, let's look into those a little bit. Scientists are using small samples, sample sizes that are too small for the research questions they're asking. They're not collecting enough data is a nice way to say it. The typical psychology study only has about 10 to 20 people in a group. So if you're gonna say, hey, you're gonna get this therapy and you're gonna get this therapy, it might be 12 people that got each therapy. And then you try to check to see if one therapy is better than the other. And that's just not enough. And we know it's not enough, but we keep doing it because it's expensive and it's hard to get people to be in the study and it's time consuming. But in many ways, we'd be better off not doing the study than to do such a small study. Um, there's something statisticians talk about which is called power your ability to find out if something's true uh, if you're right. And it turns out that the study sizes we're using are so small that when you start the experiment, it should basically never work. A statistician would never bet on it. Uh, they're just not reasonable enough. And this sounds a little abstruse and a little like a statistics class, but it's something worth thinking about because we all deal with this. We all have to make decisions about data. And it's worth knowing that the smaller the amount of data you have, the more that data can mislead you. It's a simple idea. Small samples, small amounts of data have big error and big error can lead you in the wrong direction. So I thought we'd try that out. We're gonna try a little science game where you get to be the scientists and I get to be God. Which is <laughs> much better than being a scientist. And what I mean by being a scientist is that you're gonna look for correlations, right? Correlations when two things are connected to each other. Maybe you're a scientist wanting to know if video game violence correlates with more aggression. Or maybe you're a scientist who wants to know if pesticides correlate with bee deaths. Or if, um, I don't know, seasonality correlates with changes in drunk driving. So many things that we look for correlations first to help us start to build theories. And what does a scientist get to do? They have to draw a sample. They have to collect a number of people and look for in that sample for the correlation and then try to figure out from that what might be true in the world. So we're gonna draw samples like this. See, the sample keeps changing every time I click it. But I get to be God. I get to know the truth. And my truth, I'm gonna make this really easy for you. I'm gonna make it much simpler than science. There are only gonna be three types of truth here. I will pull the data from this set where there's no correlation. Everybody agree that whatever's happening in this graph, nothing's happening in this graph, right? There's no correlation here. So I will pick your sample from this set or this set where there's a weak correlation or this set where there's a strong correlation. And all you've gotta do is tell me which one it came from. And that's easier than most scientists have it because I'm not putting negative correlations or anything else. You just gotta look at the sample and tell me where it came from. Let me get it, let me start with one like, it's coming, it's coming. Damn randomness, there we go. <laughs> Here we go, look at that sample. Isn't that a weird sample? What does it look like there's a correlation in this sample? Does it look like a positive correlation? Not at all, right? It actually looks negative, like as one goes up, the other goes down. So 
if you were a scientist, you would get this data and you'd say, oh, these variables that I care about, like pesticides and bee death, they're negatively correlated. Pesticides are good for bees, right? Which, make your guess, is it from the no correlation, the weak, or the strong? No, I hear? Just eight. There's just eight. You're right, it comes from the no correlation. See that? There is no correlation, but you randomly get your participants. So we randomly pick this person up here and this person down here, and that made it look like there's negative correlation. Isn't that deceptive? It should have been none, but the sample said it was negative. Let's try it again. Ooh, that looks pretty good, right? Which one do you think this came from? Strong? I hope so. Let's see. Nope. Moderate. Ooh, that's hard, isn't it? That sample is super misleading. It makes it look like these variables are really connected. So that's urgent. We've got to do something about this connection. But in fact, it's actually just moderate. Let's try it again. Strong? Oh, strong. I said, you're like, I've got to do the opposite. I've got to do the opposite. Uh, this one's kind of what it looked like, right? Kind of looked like nothing, and it was nothing. Strong, okay, that's good. That, so sometimes they can be revealing. That's pretty good. But it can be, ah, oh, look at that, another negative correlation out of nothing, right? Small samples are extremely misleading. They're actually sometimes worse than collecting no data at all, right? Because they can lead you way down the path. And they can lead you in lots of directions. They could take something that's not there and make it appear. They could take something that is there and make it seem like it's not, right? Sometimes we might get a correlation that looks weak, so I can do it. Come on. I want a weak one that's actually strong. Look at that, really negative. It's just super misleading. So when we collect small samples, we have to be on guard. There's a huge risk. I think one way that scientists have gone wrong is that we've been constrained by the money especially like neuroimaging or fMRI, it costs so much to run the study subjects, and we kind of delude ourselves into thinking that it's going to be informative. When the statistics are clear, these small samples can be really, really uninformative. Let me bring that home to your own world. Take a look at this map. This is a map of the rates at which people die from kidney cancer by county in the United States. And the ones that are at the highest, the top 10%, where people die like crazy from kidney cancer, not really, but it's just the highest, are black, right? That looks pretty scary. Would you want to move to this corner of Nevada? Heck no, right? I mean, for lots of reasons, but also kidney cancer, right? That looks really scary. You put this data out there and you think, uh-oh, and yeah, look what's happening in Virginia, Oh, and of course, look at the South, it's so polluted. Like, I, you know, you can make up stories right away about what's going on here. And you start thinking, I don't want to go there, what's going on there, why are people dying from kidney cancer? Um, whoops, what, did, what happened? Oops, did it already happen? Look at this. What am I doing? Highest, whoops, lowest. Highest, lowest. Is it hard to tell the difference? It is, right? Isn't that weird? Look, here's the highest. Look at this corner of Idaho and Nevada. Wow, kidney cancer alley, right there. Oh, and also lowest kidney cancer valley, right next to each other. Isn't that weird? That shouldn't be, right? What's going on here? What is the common denominator? Why are these counties on the top and bottom lists? Is it really because there's something going on with cancer there? Is there something in the water? Is this where fracking happens? Oh, fracking. Anybody? Look at this map. What sticks out about where these are at or what these counties are like? Have any of you ever been to this part of Northwest Nevada? Who said it? Low population. Who lives in the Northwest corner of Nevada? <laughs> no one as far as I know, right? Who lives in Montana or Wyoming? Which one is which? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody goes there, right? These are rural counties with very few people. There might be 100 people in this county, in Montana, Wyoming-ish, right? There might be 100 people there. So if one of them dies from kidney cancer the year they did this study, their kidney cancer rate is one out of 100. That's enormous. They're on the top of the list. Whereas right next to it is another county with 100 people. And if nobody died from kidney cancer the year of that study, they're at the bottom of the list. That's the best place to live. Is that real? No, 
That's not real. Small samples are deceptive. Small samples lead us astray. Small samples get us chasing noise, being like, oh my God, there's something in the water there. We gotta investigate. No, you don't. That's just what happens when you have small samples. And it happens a lot. People lose billions of dollars every year not understanding this. And apparently now scientists too. Every time we rank things, the things that have the smallest numbers in them versus the biggest tend to be at the top and the bottom of the rankings. Every year when Illinois releases its school reports on your standardized testing, who's at the top? Small schools. Because if like two more students ate their Wheaties that day for MEEP testing, their scores are going to be through the roof. Because they can influence it if there's 16 homeschool kids going there. Are two kids eating their Wheaties going to change CPS's scores? No. Big data is stable and more reflective of the truth. Small data sets jump around a ton. And we make tons of unfair, rash decisions based on small data sets all the time, right? Uh, hey, Dean Carlson, class size. Every time we do student evaluations, who's probably at the top and the bottom of your list? The people that teach seven people in a seminar. Anybody at the top of the bottom of the list that teaches 60 people in a big lecture? Probably not. If they are, then there's, that's a whole other story. But the top and the bottom of the list are going to be the smallest groups. Uh, every year, people look at mutual funds to try to figure out where to invest their money. The ones that have the smallest amount of money are always at the top and the bottom of the list because they're the most variation and the most error. And so people invest in them thinking this is going to make a lot of money, and then they don't. They lose a lot of money chasing noise. And I'll put a word on it. You've seen this, subsets. Somebody has some data, and they're looking at it like, oh, look, here's, our, um, here's the number of students that, apply, that asked about applying to Dominican last year. You look at it and say, oh, okay, that's interesting. But then somebody says, but you know what? I broke it down by month, and then things got really weird. I noticed it in July, it went like this, but in January, it went like this. Well, every time you break down your data, you made it into smaller and smaller bins, and so the jumping around gets bigger and bigger. Maybe it's something real, but often all you've done is introduce noise so that you have something to think about. And then you go chasing that noise and making huge mistakes. Does that make some sense? And what's amazing is the smartest people in the world fall for this. We all fall for this. I'm going to warn you about it, and I hope it'll stick in your mind at this point. That's why one of the reasons I'm so excited to give this talk. But I'm willing to bet, like me, at some point you're going to kick yourself. You're like, ah, damn it, I just got fooled by the small sample fallacy again. It's so easy to do. What do you do to solve it? The way you solve it is you've got to get more data. You've got to seek replication. You've got to look at the data over and over again in the same circumstances until you accumulate more. If this county in wherever Nevada keeps being at the top of your list year after year, there is something in the water and you don't want to go there. But if it's the top and then the bottom and then the middle and then the top and then the bottom, that's just what happens with small samples and you let it go. Don't be rash and run into it until you know. So small sample sizes are a problem. Another problem is that scientists don't often give us the full story. And we all do this too. Oh. How often are scientists confirm their theories? I'm going to accelerate here a little bit, but I want to see. So they develop their ideas and they put them to the test. And we have this beautiful, normal looking distribution. You guys made it all on your own. And it looks like most of you think that it's somewhere around 30 to 40% of the time when we try something out that we might be right. Which sounds about right to me, right? We're not psychic. When we try a new idea, we are often probably going to be wrong. It's not going to be 100% that we're right. But let's look at what we publish. In the 1950s, a psychologist named Theodore Sterling noticed that his colleagues, when he read their papers, seemed to be geniuses, seemed to be way, way smarter than him. And he decided to actually sit down and put some numbers on it. He pulled every psychology journal for a, a one-year period, and he looked at all the papers, and he found that out of 294 papers he read, 286 of them confirmed what the psychologist thought. They were right 97% of the time. Is that what we thought what science would be like? No. That's weird, right? How could they be right so often? Why do we give them grants if they already know the answer? He followed this up 30 years later. He did the same study. Still the same thing. If you read the papers we publish, it looks like we are just firing on all cylinders. I predicted this, and it was true. Then I predicted this, and it was true. But that can't really be the whole story, right? It's not possible. Either we're psychic or there's something else going on. We're not being honest about everything we did and tried. Right? Let me give you an example of how bad this can go. 
In 2010, a group of scholars were able to assemble data to look at a drug called raboxetine, which was being sold in Europe as an antidepressant. It was never approved in the United States, so we didn't have this problem. And they looked at whether or not what the data said about how well it worked. At that point, when they did the summary, the published findings were very clear. There was a medium-sized trial comparing it to placebo. Looked great. There, were several, there was another medium-sized trial, the largest trial, comparing it to other antidepressants. It did just as well. So if you were a physician and you wanted to know if you should prescribe it and you went and looked online and you're a Google Scholar, you would be like, wow, this is a good drug. This works. It's not the whole story, though. A lot of data had never been published at this point. And through lawsuits and other methods, these researchers were able to get it. It turned out this drug company had done six other experiments comparing the drug to placebo. And not a single one of them showed a benefit of the drug. They published one out of seven. The other six didn't work. It turned out that they had another 1,600 patients who they'd compared to existing drugs. Not only did they not get better, but they had worse side effects and were, uh, more common and more severe side effects. When these researchers looked at the data as a whole, the conclusion was unequivocal. This is an unsafe and ineffective drug, and it was pulled from the market. But that's not the story that was out there from what was published. That's depressing, right? It's enough to start to get you mad. You should be getting mad at this point. Are you getting mad yet? That's, that's upsetting. And it's even more upsetting that it's not just the companies that have these dirty tricks. As a matter of fact, they may have learned the dirty tricks from their academic researchers who do a lot of the same things. The positive effects that are published may often be just the tip of the iceberg. Um, for example, I'm going to skip one here. This paper did something genius. It followed people's projects from dissertation to publication. And what it found was, when it was in a dissertation stage, they were right about what they predicted about one time out of two, one to one, true to false hypotheses. So they looked at what they predicted, looked at the data. They were 50-50. But then when the paper was published by the same people with the same data, suddenly they were two to one. They were much, much better scientists. How did that happen? Well, anything they were wrong about, they tended to just not mention in the final paper. If they had predicted it the wrong direction, they just changed their hypothesis. Suddenly, they predicted the opposite. And if it was something they never predicted at all, often they said that they had. This is not good. We're not getting the whole story. Now again, I'm running out of time, so I want to do this quickly. There are reasons why we don't publish everything. And some of those reasons are good reasons. Um, we don't want to, we make mistakes a lot. Just come into the lab with me for a summer, and you'll see that I personally screw up my students' research on a regular basis. I mislabel tubes, or I throw the wrong thing away, and everything gets borked, and we all cry, but then we try again. And there's no reason to fill a journal article with all the dumb things I've done. We don't have to publish that. There's also lots of exploration and tinkering where we're not totally serious, just trying. We don't have to publish all that. And there's also lots of crap science out there. We don't want to publish that. The problem is that the need to make decisions about what to publish and not publish often lets bias creep in. So we have this kind of flow chart. Did you finish the study? Yep. Did you make any mistakes? Nope. Is it interesting? Yep. OK, then finally publish it. But if any of these don't work, then throw it in the garbage. It didn't work. right? Now, that makes sense that we would do these checks. But the problem is, the whole time, the scientists can be sitting there wondering, is that a result I really like? Is that a result that I'm really going to get famous for? Is that a result that fits with what I've already published? And, if the, and so we start to conflate these decisions. Oh, this isn't a result I really like. Well, I must not be done with that study yet. I must need to run more people to find out if actually I do like the result. Right? Or is it error free? Well, I mean, that one where it didn't work the way I thought it would, I probably made a mistake on it. So let's not publish it. Right? Bias can keep creeping in. There's a tremendous pull in all of our lives to keep focusing on what we like and disregarding the things that contradict us. And what we need is a bright red line when we make decisions to try to keep that type of bias from creeping in. Now, I'm glad to say there is some good news in this talk, that that's starting to happen. There's this whole movement out there called the open science movement. And it's trying to change science to, get it, to start to do things differently. And I'm proud to be a part of that. Uh, there are a bunch of things that are happening, reporting disclosures, where people have to state in the paper, by the way, this really is all the data, promise, pinky swear, <laughs> I'm not hiding anything behind my back. 
There's what's called pre-registration, where they write down what they're going to do, how they're going to analyze the data, how many people are going to be in the study beforehand, and put it in the public so that we can check to make sure they didn't change things the way I showed you they can. They can. There's more funding for replication so that we can try things out and replicate and make sure that they're working right. And there's the thing that I think will change the world tremendously if it catches on is what we call pre-registered review. That's where the scientist, before they do the work, sends it to the journal and says, here's my idea, here's how I'm going to collect the data, and this is why the data is going to be the right data to collect. The journal looks at it and peer reviews it, and if they agree, the scientist then goes and does the research and it's guaranteed to be published, whether it's positive or negative. Because if it's an interesting thing that the rest of the scientists want to know about, we should find out the answer, regardless. Right? And we should also get the feedback from our peers before we went and did the study so that we could actually listen to them rather than just say, no, no, that wasn't right. I, we didn't need to change that because it's too late to change it. I think that this, if it's widely adopted and it's getting a start, will change science dramatically. And I think it's an easy one because we already hate peer review so bad. So doing it a little differently, I think, would be an easy pill to swallow. And um, the book that Tracy mentioned, one of the things I'm most excited about is that it's one of our first textbooks that we're using for psychology majors to try to teach them these updated practices from the start so that they start with the idea of telling the whole story, so that they start with the idea of not collecting small samples. And we think that if we reach you, the future scientists, you'll grow up thinking this is normal. And you'll have your own crises to figure out some even better way of doing it, but you'll start off better than we did, which is the best thing we could do as teachers. Right? For your own personal lesson, you may not care about peer review, one thing I think is interesting is that the common theme in what we're reforming in science is pre-commitment, writing out what we think is going to happen, writing out how we think things are going to work beforehand so that we have less opportunity to slip and slide and have bias. Think about how this could apply to your own life. Maybe you think you're going to buy a car. You might write down how much you're going to be willing to pay before you go to the dealership, before that, oh my god, I so want that cute little Kia Mini, like starts to work on you. Right? And try. Maybe you'll defy it, but at least you have tried to stick to a decision before the salesperson gets their hooks into you. See what I mean? And you can use this a lot in life. When you pre-commit to things, it's not a magic bullet, but it can often help you try to avoid the pull of emotion and the desire to fudge things the way you want to see it. So what have I told you? Uh, I told you some depressing stuff about science. It's not working as well as it should. But that's also strangely kind of normal for science to not be where we want it to be. We always aspire for it to be better. It's probably even worse than it should be, but it's just normal that that's what we do, that we constantly look at it and assess it and try to improve it. So don't panic. There are lots of issues to address. The two I try to talk about the most are things I hope you might see some relevance in your own lives. Beware of small sample sizes and try hard to pre-commit to your ideas so that you give them a fair test and can't slip slide out of them. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't start hating on science. This doesn't mean you'd have to, you can stop studying for your Bio 111 quiz and be like, it's all BS anyways. <laughs> no, some of it's real and it's going to be on the test. <laughs> Get involved. If you find this type of stuff fascinating, come and take these classes in training in biology and chemistry and physics and psychology to get the training to do this stuff and to be that next generation that's going to do it better. And when you're consuming science, when you're reading about science, be sure to look for sample sizes. Be sure to look for assurances that it's really the whole story. Be sure to see if it has anything about it being replicated yet. Because if it hasn't, it's probably not ready for us to totally bank on it. So, whew, that went by quickly, and it just gets hotter and hotter in here. I guess it's just a, just a hot topic. Uh, I have been, as I said at the beginning, outstandingly lucky to be supported and colleagues with so many outstanding people, from Tracy to our entire psychology staff who've thought and talked about statistics and pushed us to do better, um, to wonderful collaborators at other universities like Concordia and College of DuPage, and many really amazing students who go on to do such amazing things that make us so proud. That's the least depressing thing I have to say about this, is that it's been an incredible and fascinating journey. So thank you for coming, and I'll take questions.
questions. And if you, you know, it's 702, so if you have to slide out, just that's okay. I'll, I'll take away your extra credit, but you, you can do it. <laughs> Anyone? Comments? Questions? Tracy? Yes. <laughs> like